Over the course of the anarchy, we've seen both sides gain the upper hand and then lose their momentum. After the siege of Oxford, Empress Matilda, who had escaped the siege in spectacular fashion, was now in the safety of Wallingford Castle. She didn't stay long, as after a few days of resting, she left for Devizes Castle, which was safer as the castle was deeper in her own territory. A few days after staying at Devizes, Robert of Gloucester arrived with an army. He had assembled to march on Oxford in order to free Empress Matilda, but before he arrived, he learned she had escaped. He quickly turned his forces around and marched towards his sister's location. Upon arriving, Robert was glad to see his sister unharmed and well. He had also brought with him from Normandy his nephew and Matilda's heir, Henry. With the young Henry now in England, the cause of the war would turn away from Empress Matilda being crowned as ruler of England, but instead ensuring that Henry would be king, either by taking the crown from King Stephen or succeeding him. The problem of succeeding King Stephen was he already had a male heir, Eustace, who was a few years older than Henry. So if King Stephen were to pass on the crown, Henry would have to fight Eustace for the throne. But for now, the fighting was focused around the Midlands and the southwest of England. The market town of Wareham was important to both sides, as not only was the town an important trade port, the town had a regional mint, a valuable prize useful for minting a ruler's coinage. Robert had captured the town when he returned from Normandy, and also reinforced the defences. By the summer of 1143, the campaigning season was underway. King Stephen's army marched towards Wareham. The royal authority was weak in the west county of England, so Wareham would be an excellent rally point to launch more campaigns further into Angevin territory. But the town's defences were too difficult to overcome, so King Stephen marched north to the town of Witton. Witton Castle was the furthest outpost the king controlled, similar to Wallingford Castle for the Angevins, as both sites were on the edges of rival territories. On the journey to Witton, King Stephen joined with his brother, the Bishop Henry, and together they arrived at Witton. The details on what happened next are convoluted. The deeds of King Stephen mention a pitched battle took place here between Earl Robert and King Stephen. Yet another source states the king was trapped in the castle and made a sortie out, but was beaten and only escaped thanks to his lieutenant, William Martel, holding the rear guard back to allow the king and his brother to escape. This reminds us of the Battle of Lincoln in 1141. The capture of such a loyal man to King Stephen was irreplaceable, as King Stephen had few men loyal to him. He offered Sherborne Castle for the release of William. Such a castle for one man shows how important loyal men were to the king. After the events at Witten, in September 1143, King Stephen was holding a royal court at St Albans, with several nobles in attendance. One noble, Geoffrey de Mandeville, the Earl of Essex, had amassed lands and money during the Civil War, as he, like many other barons and lords, swapped sides when King Stephen was first captured, but then rejoined after Empress Matilda's flight from London. However, Geoffrey had accumulated too much power, which annoyed many barons, and there were also rumours, at least according to the deeds of King Stephen, that Geoffrey was guilty of treason and planned to bestow the kingdom to the Countess of Anjou. These accusations and pressure from the other nobles made King Stephen take action, and he ordered Geoffrey to be arrested. His castles were stripped from him and his land taken. He was then released and immediately sought retribution. He first went to the Isle of Ely, an area of England that was covered in swampland, and made it his base of operations. He then seized Ramsey Abbey, chucked the monks out, and then turned the abbey into a fortress. The chronicler Henry of Huntingdon chastises him and claims the abbey walls bled from ear to ear while occupied. Geoffrey then conducted a harrying raid across Cambridge. For these actions, Geoffrey was excommunicated by the church. Their chaos cause was a boom for the Angevins, as the fighting at Ely would keep King Stephen busy as Geoffrey would target the king and his supporters' estates. To combat Geoffrey's raids, King Stephen ordered the construction of several castles, as attacking in the Fens was too risky for now. Geoffrey's war against the king was gaining strength, as a few lords supported him, mostly through family ties, like his brother-in-law, William de Say. The Earl of Norfolk also gave his support, this gave Geoffrey more defences around Ely. East Anglia was quickly becoming another war zone that the king would have to fight for, but luck was on his side, 
as in September of 1144, Geoffrey attacked the half-built castle at Burwell in Cambridgeshire. During the attack, Geoffrey took off his helmet, either to survey the area or to cool down in the hot weather, when a crossbowman spotted him atop one of the castle walls and shot at him. The bolt struck him in the head. At first, the injury appeared superficial, but it became infected, and Geoffrey died from the injury a week later. A potential disaster was averted for the king, as the Angevins couldn't act in time to take advantage, as one of their own commanders was now dead. Miles of Gloucester, first Earl of Hereford, had died on Christmas Eve in 1143 from a hunting accident. He was one of the first nobles to swear allegiance to Empress Matilda when she landed in England. During this civil war, we've shown the actions of the nobles and mentioned when towns and cities were sacked by either side, but we've never mentioned how the average person of this time in history felt. As the war went on, agricultural labourers were decreasing, leaving crops to wither, farms and estates were either looted or abandoned. The deeds of King Stephen writes of the plight of the common people. You could see villages with famous names standing solitary and almost empty because of peasants of both sex and all ages were dead. Fields whitening with a magnificent harvest, with their cultivators taken away by the agency of the devastating famine, and all England wearing a look of sorrow and misfortune. Now, we will move on from the action in England to Normandy, France, as in January of 1144, the conquest of Normandy under Geoffrey of Anjou was complete. Five years of campaigning were over, and he was proclaimed Duke of Normandy, and recognised as Duke by his overlord, the King of the Franks, Louis VII. For now, Empress Matilda's one part of her inheritance for Henry was guaranteed, as King Stephen was too occupied in England to launch an invasion into Normandy. Yet King Stephen was far from removed off the English throne, and was as active as ever, besieging Lincoln Castle again in 1144. But after a siege tower collapse and killed 80 of his men, he abandoned the siege. The Angevins had been building counter castles around the Malmesbury Royal Castle, but the king arrived and pushed back the Angevins before moving on to Tetbury in Gloucestershire, but retreated when Earl Robert arrived with Welsh reinforcements as the king wished to avoid a pitched battle. But, on the retreat back towards Winchester, the king took the castle at Winchcombe by surprise and captured it. Surprise attacks would be King Stephen's best offensive in taking the Angevin forts and castles, as a prolonged siege could develop into a pitched battle if Robert's army arrived. The year of 1144 was the same as any other years during the Civil War, with plenty of raids, ambushes and night attacks, but the following year of 1145 would see plenty of betrayals. As with the year of 1144, 1145 saw the construction of several counter castles around the Midlands and South West. One castle at Farringdon would become a centre point of conflict between King Stephen and Robert of Gloucester, as Robert's son, Philip, sought to build the castle on a hill, an ideal site to fortify. The hill was originally a Celtic stronghold. The structure was being built using stone and wood, suggesting the castle would become a permanent fortress as opposed to a wooden countercastle. Our main source, the Deeds of King Stephen, mentions Robert brought in many supporters to build this castle, and the garrison were described as the flower of the whole army. It's important to note that at this point in history, we have lost two of our chroniclers, William of Malmesbury and Audric Vitalis. Their chronicles here would have been incredibly helpful, along with their insight. To combat the threat of this new castle, King Stephen called upon the London militia to assist him, and he assembled his army at Oxford before marching to Farringdon and setting up a counter-castle. Earl Robert was outnumbered and decided to wait for reinforcements, yet the King's daily attacks on Robert's castle were constant as the King had siege engines to assault the walls, perhaps using the same ones he had at Oxford. The constant attacks worked as many of the defenders fell, while the rest offered terms of surrender to the king. The deeds of King Stephen states the victory as a splendid triumph. One surprising event that stunned the Angevins came from Robert's own son Philip, who switched sides after making an agreement with the king. We don't know why Philip switched, but now the king had control of the road from Oxford to Malmesbury, leaving Wallingford Castle dangerously exposed. There is a common theme we see in King Stephen's reign, 
diplomatic faux pas with his nobles, as in 1146, Ranulf, the Earl of Chester, makes his peace with the king, as he had territorial disputes with King David of Scotland, so to remedy this, he made a deal with King Stephen. Ranulf would aid the king, and in return, the king would partake in a campaign against the Welsh, as they had been raiding Ranulf's lands. The deal started off well, as Bedford was captured, and Wallingford Castle was again besieged, but the king's advisers told him not to help Ranulf for several reasons. One, Ranulf was deemed untrustworthy, after all, he did switch sides, and two, Wales was not somewhere the king needed to be, as leaving England could spell trouble. King Stephen used his now classic tactic of inviting a noble to a meeting and then arresting them, before stripping them of their lands and castles, before letting them go, and he did exactly that to Ranulf at Northampton. After being chained and berated, Ranulf was released and immediately rejoined the Angevins, and just like Geoffrey de Mandeville, he assembled his army and boldly set about capturing royal castles as well as building counter castles. Another reason for Ranulf's fury towards the king was that his nephew, Gilbert Fitzrichard, was also taken hostage and forced to give his lands to the king. These acts would ostracise King Stephen from his nobles, as few would want to meet with the king if relations had gone sour. The king would have to rely on himself and his lieutenant, William of Ypres. By 1147, the war would start to wind down as the Second Crusade was now underway in Europe. Several prominent nobles left England to join the crusade. The Beaumont twins and Philip of Gloucester all left for the Holy Lands. The king's position was stronger than it had been, but he could never find that knockout blow to the Angevins, which the king needed, as they would soon have a new figurehead to rally behind. Henry Plantagenet, heir to Empress Matilda, was now 14 and was getting an appetite for warfare, as he launched his own attacks into England in March of 1147. He brought with him a meagre force of mercenaries and knights. Even with such a small number of troops, he couldn't afford to pay them. But his landing was enough to spread the word that Henry, grandson of Henry I, was here to claim his birthright, and the rumours began to circulate that he had brought a massive army. After a few weeks of lacklustre campaigning, nothing was gained and Henry's foolish plan nearly led to him being captured. An unorganised plan by an overzealous young man eager to get to grips with the warfare of the time. But sometimes this is how lessons need to be taught, as Empress Matilda showed by not aiding her son, as to her mind he risked everything on a bet. The Deeds of King Stephen describes the campaign failure. When it was certain and plainly noised abroad to the knowledge of all that he had brought a small party of knights, not an army, and they, having been hired not ready for money, but for money promised in the future, accomplished nothing of note, but were always sluggish and remiss of their doings. Then the king's party took heart again and resisted them everywhere with courage and resolution. Henry tried to return to Normandy, but he lacked the funds to even afford the crossing. But most surprisingly of all, he asked his rival relative, King Stephen, for money, which Stephen gave him, which isn't that surprising as we've seen forgiving and chivalrous nature from him over the course of the anarchy. King Stephen may have felt confident in winning the civil war, as he had just seen off the heir of his major rival, and another bonus was that some of her most loyal commanders had died, and by the end of 1147, it certainly looked like the king would win the overall victory, as in the autumn, Robert of Gloucester fell ill with a fever and later died. He was the main commander of the Angevins and had led them to winning several victories during this period, but not only that, he was a close brother to Empress Matilda and she must have felt profound sorrow over his death, as she herself would leave England in 1148 and never return. Instead, doing all she could to help her son gain the throne. Robert was succeeded by his son William, but he was not as talented as his father at warfare. The Civil War had been going on for some 13 years, and now a new generation of combatants was starting to emerge. King Stephen's son Eustace was now 18, and would take part in the campaigns, and Henry Plantagenet would soon be of age, but as we've seen, he was already playing an active role. Some of the older players were starting to disappear from our chronicles. Brian Fitzcount, custodian of Wallingford Castle, may have retired to a monastery around 1147, 
Empress Matilda was now living in Normandy. The situation in Normandy was stable. Her husband, Geoffrey Plantagenet, had established his authority here and there was no risk of it falling back into King Stephen's hands, as all opposition had been defeated. The relationship between Empress Matilda and Geoffrey was also improved as both were working towards aiding their eldest son, Henry. By 1149, Henry had planned another expedition to England, with the help of his mother this time, and landed in England around Easter of 1149. Henry's first stop was Devizes Castle to meet his potential allies, his uncle, Reginald Earl of Cornwall, the Earl of Salisbury, John Marshall, the one-eyed Earl, his cousin, William of Gloucester, and Roger of Hereford, a powerful group, but nobles that were previously allied to Empress Matilda, but were now pledging fealty to Henry. The next location on this journey was the Scottish-controlled city of Carlisle. The reason for this visit was to see how much support Henry could gather on his way north of England, and secondly, he was to be knighted by his great uncle, King David of Scotland. Upon arriving, King David greeted Henry warmly and knighted him before making a mutual alliance of aid. Now feeling bolstered with strong allies, Henry sought to attack York. But King Stephen was forewarned about Henry leaving Carlisle, so the king had an army ready to attack whatever force arrived at York. Fearing encirclement, Henry and his allies then split up to create diversions, so Henry could escape. But King Stephen and Eustace had laid several traps and ambushes along the way south of England. Eustace was incredibly determined to capture Henry. Even in safe places like Gloucester, Henry had to be careful, as Eustace used Oxford as a launching zone to raid across Angevin territory. King Stephen was busy heading to Lincoln in order to relieve the city from Renolf. Henry was on the defensive, as at Devizes Castle, Eustace managed to break into the outer part of the castle before being repulsed. This campaign was another failure for Henry. Henry's biggest problem was simply getting troops and money from his father, who was reluctant to aid a campaign into England. Henry wouldn't return to England until 1153, leaving his allies to withstand the full might of King Stephen. But Henry promised he would return. While his allies waited, Henry was learning how to rule from his father, Geoffrey, who had stabilised Normandy, as John of Marmaltia describes Normandy under Geoffrey. The land was quiet under the watchful count for about 10 years. Empress Matilda was busy working on having Henry's claim as the future Duke of Normandy secured by appealing to the French King Louis VII. She was also trying to get the French King to support Henry over Eustace for the English throne. Of course, King Stephen was also trying to keep the French King on his side by sending his brother, Bishop Henry of Winchester, to negotiate. But thanks to some influential French clergymen, Empress Matilda won over the French King. Geoffrey and Henry would eventually meet the French King and his Queen to give homage and to be recognised as Duke of Normandy. After this successful trip, Geoffrey and Henry started to head home. But along the road home, Geoffrey developed a fever and died in September of 1151. Henry was now Duke of Anjou, Maine and Normandy at age just 18. Empress Matilda was now a widow. It's difficult to tell if she would have been tremendously upset over her husband's death, as they didn't have the best relationship. But now, Henry was on the path to the English throne. 1152 would be a successful year for Henry and Empress Matilda. In March, Louis VII divorced his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. She immediately went back to her own lands, dodging potential suitors who wanted to kidnap her and marry her. She then sent a message to Henry to meet her, and they married hastily. Henry's power was growing, and upon marrying Eleanor, he created an enemy more powerful than King Stephen, King Louis, as the marriage was a shocking surprise to everyone, least of all Louis. Now the French king sought to ally with two of Henry's rivals in France, Henry, Count of Champagne, Theobald, Count of Blois, and of course, Eustace. Empress Matilda managed to warn Henry before he sailed off for England. Luck was on Henry's side, as his troops were ready to march. He then chased the approaching army that was heading into his territories, and they fled. Henry, now full of anger, headed to Anjou to quell the lords there, and they soon submitted. Henry was certainly showing the traits his grandfather had, 
putting down any revolt that dared to question his authority. With his French holdings now subdued, he planned a campaign to England, this time with his own coin to fund the army. King Stephen's position was still not secure as Henry's allies continued to resist him and Wallingford Castle was still under Angevin control. There was also the problem of ensuring Eustace's succession to the throne, as Henry was now looking like the most attractive candidate for the lords and barons of England. King Stephen appealed to the Pope, but the claim of succession was rejected. He then tried to have the English clergy crown Eustace, but that was also rejected. Angered by this, King Stephen threatened and locked the clergy away and took their possessions, but they did not relent and were eventually released. The year of 1152 would start with tragedy for King Stephen, as his wife, Queen Matilda, died in May. She had been incredibly important to the king, both as a wife and saviour, and her death affected King Stephen greatly. The rest of the year would see a rise in conflicts in the south of England, as John Marshall had constructed a castle in contested land. King Stephen perked himself up and rode with his forces, setting up a siege camp and besieging the castle. William sent forward a truce to King Stephen and would give one of his sons as hostage. King Stephen agreed and John handed over his son, William Marshall. The King briefly pulled back his forces to allow John to approach the castle. John then broke his agreement and fortified the castle. The history of William Marshall tells this tale. What occurred was that the siege forces withdrew and the marshal refortified his castle. He found it very much lacking in defensive forces, so he installed there valiant knights, sergeants and archers, determined to put up a good defence and unwilling to surrender the castle. King Stephen, angered by this broken promise, quickly sent word to John, informing him that as he had broken his word, his son's life was now forfeit and would be executed. But John replied in a brutal fashion, stating that, he did not care about the child, since he still had the anvil and hammers to produce even finer ones. A horrid response. But King Stephen could not allow a child to be executed, so William remained a hostage. By 1153, Henry was ready to sail to England again. He landed with 140 knights and some 3,000 infantry, a sizeable force with the hope of reinforcements once he landed, and again, with his arrival, word spread quickly that Henry's army was numerous. King Stephen reacted with his usual haste and quickly marched with his army to meet Henry, who was besieging Malmesbury Castle. The Castilian managed to escape and inform the king. With the two armies nearing each other, it seemed likely a pitched battle would take place. The two armies would come across each other at the River Avon, but the heavy rain prevented any sort of violence. Both armies then went their separate ways, Henry to the north and King Stephen returned to London. There was a sense of unease in King Stephen's camp, as some of the nobles were negotiating in secret, as the king never really gained the loyalty of his nobles, as his past actions didn't help and now it was starting to affect the course of the war, as Henry was starting to gain momentum. But the king hadn't given up and carried on besieging Wallingford Castle as the castle was close to surrendering due to lack of food. In August, Henry arrived and attacked the counter castle. Once again, it seemed both sides would fight in a pitched battle, but it was not to be as the nobles were fed up with the war and the clergy were now actively intervening to make peace in the kingdom. The king sustained an injury as he was thrown off his horse three times. The deeds of King Stephen described the event. The leading men of each army shrank on both sides, from a conflict that was not merely between countrymen, but meant the desolation of the whole kingdom, thinking it wise to join all together for the establishment of peace. The chroniclers also mention that both men were aware of the treachery of their followers and were reluctantly compelled to make a truce. With the clergy acting as the chief negotiators, a further peace was made at Winchester. King Stephen, perhaps ill or just tired from the whole war, agreed to remove Eustace from the succession, which greatly angered him and he stormed off. But he would die a few weeks later, and his death sealed any hope of King Stephen's line of succession continuing. 
He did have another son, but he too relinquished any claim in return for lands. The final agreement was made under these terms. Henry would become King Stephen's adopted son and heir, and Henry would pay homage to King Stephen as his king. Once the agreement was ratified, peace was finally made, and so the civil war in England, known as the Anarchy, was over. <laughs>